Welcome all to the Centum Capital Partners webinar series. Today we'll be having our first webinar titled, What Can We Do to Prepare for the World That Comes After COVID-19? My name is Wambua Kimeo, and I'm a partner at Centum Capital Partners. Um, I'll start off by introducing Centum Investments and uh, Centum Capital Partners. Uh, Centum Investment is East Africa's leading investment company publicly listed in the Nairobi and the Uganda Securities Exchange since 1967. We have proven to be an operationally focused firm with a track record of exits, exit focused and uh, strategic leadership of our portfolio companies. Um, Centum Capital Partners, on the other hand, is the private equity arm of Centum, Cap Centum Investments and is an indep independently managed uh, subsidiary with full economic alignment between management and the investors. Our, our governance structure is also in, independent. Why are we hosting these this webinars? So Centum Capital Partners remains a repository of knowledge that we have acquired over time by all the investment uh, transactions that we've done, as well as the information that we've gained over the period of time as we've analyzed various sectors of the economy and made investments and exits. On the other hand, we are also an, an, an indigenous investor and we believe we are well placed to have a discussion and give you your share our experiences as well as our thoughts um, during this period of, uh, uh, of, of unprecedented change and uh, in the circumstances that we are. In terms of uh, today, today, given the topic that we have highlighted, uh, our main presenter is going to be Fred Morimi. Fred Morimi is the managing managing partner of Centum Capital Partners. Fred has 15 years of experience, having spent the last seven years as the managing director and managing partner of Centum Capital. Fred manages, has managed a portfolio totaling $300 million. And in that portfolio, he has managed to deliver a total gross return in USD of 21% during his time at Centum. Uh, with those few remarks, I'd like to, to pass this over to, to Fred. Welcome, Fred. Thank you very much, Wambua, and uh, good afternoon to all. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us, uh, even in the current uh, uh, times that we find ourselves in. Um, this is, like Wambua mentioned, is one of uh, several parts of a series that we're going to be running around uh, the COVID-19 and what it means for businesses. Um, so we trust that you'll be able to join us for even the future webinars that we're going to be to be having. Um, as Wambua has mentioned, uh, for today we are looking at what, what can we do to prepare for the world that comes after uh, COVID-19. So we're going to begin by looking at how long we expect to be in crisis, um, what will be the effect of the crisis on, on our economies, uh, what should businesses do to respond, um, Closer to us is then also what's the expected impact on the mergers and acquisitions in, uh, in this uh, period of, of COVID-19. And then we'll open up to questions uh, at, at the end. So just uh, taking up from that, uh, to begin with, we began by asking ourselves, how long do we expect to be in this period? Um, we've looked back. Uh, the last uh, century, last 100 years, um, and seen what have flu pandemics looked like in the past, uh, what have they done to our economies in the past. Um, you can see in the last uh, 100 years, we've gone, the world has gone through about seven uh, pandemics. Um, of interest uh, to us is, uh, number one, it looks like um, looking back as far as the Spanish uh, flu in uh, 1918, that lasted uh, almost three years, uh, 36 months, from beginning to when it was finally said to have been contained. Uh, also, remarkably, there was a deadlier second wave that came through uh, almost uh, 10 months uh, from when the, the, the pandemic first struck. Uh, we looked at others, the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu, uh, the SARS virus, uh, the swine flu, Ebola, and now what you're dealing with today. And it looks like, um, from previous flu pandemics, one none of them has uh, taken shorter than a period of 14 months uh, to get over. Um, 
which means that for us with the COVID-19, perhaps uh, we're looking at, uh, we've been at it for five months so far. Uh, perhaps we still have another seven, nine months to go. Uh, we are of course hoping that the world is better prepared for this uh, pandemic and hopefully will be shorter. Uh, but clearly it's going to be with us perhaps for the better part of 2020. Um, will there be a deadlier second wave that comes this time? I think that's a question that uh, even the healthcare professionals are struggling to answer. It could be that even as we look to cautiously reopen, uh, that we need to continue to be uh, disciplined, continue to stay safe. Uh, but clearly we're looking at the last uh, 100 years. I think we have no reason to believe that this pandemic is going to go away uh, quickly. Um, I think the other thing that is uh, instructive for us is what impact has it, do we expect it's going to have on economies? Uh, for this, again, we looked back. Uh, I think the last global crisis that we had was the 2008-2009 financial crisis, uh, which, which wrecked uh, havoc on, on markets. Uh, just looking at the MSCI index, uh, we can see that there's quite a dip uh, in uh, the period of 2008-2009. Uh, uh, we anticipate that we might go through the same cycle. Uh, instructively, is, um, it took the world perhaps two years, around two and a half years, for markets to go back to pre-crisis levels. Uh, so for us, in addition to the uh, public health issue that we're dealing with around the, the virus, and there's also the question of how long it will take markets uh, to recover. And just looking at the, at the experience we had in the financial crisis, um, again, uh, perhaps from history, uh, we might be looking at, at, uh, at being in a, in a recession uh, for the next two, uh, two and a half years before markets fully recover back to, to pre-crisis levels. And this really is a backdrop for us that we are uh, looking at and asking ourselves what do we, what should businesses do to be able to prepare for the world uh, that is coming? Uh, clearly, businesses need to take a long-term view. Um, we can also see, just looking at the price of uh, crude oil, uh, again, looking back at the 2008-2009 crisis, again, from a peak uh, in April 2008 uh, to the slump, we can see the markets only recovered about uh, two, two, two and a half years later. So similar time frame. Um, of interest uh, for us is that gold seems to be a reasonably good hedge in times of crisis. Uh, prices of gold remain uh, stable and actually increased uh, through, through crisis. And even as businesses are looking to prepare for this uh, long-term crisis that we're going to be in, uh, perhaps there are still opportunities uh, for investment, for, for hedging uh, our businesses. And that's really what we're going to be asking ourselves today. Um, the IMF has given forecasts of uh, anticipated uh, growth or perhaps negative growth uh, in economies, looking at it in terms of GDP. Overall, the world is expected to experience a negative 3% uh, decline in, in, uh, in uh, gross domestic product. And that will primarily be, as you can see, from uh, the IMF forecast for 2020, that's primarily expected uh, to be seen in particularly the larger economies of the world, uh, the USA at a negative 5.9%, uh, Europe at a negative 7.5%, Japan at negative 5.2%, the United Kingdom, the fifth largest economy in the world, at negative 6.5%. Uh, on the continent, uh, we expect the larger economies in, uh, on the continent, Nigeria and South Africa, to also experience negative uh, growth rates in terms of GDP. Uh, our region uh, of East Africa, uh, IMF anticipates that we will grow, albeit at a slower rate, uh, between one to three and a half percent between Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda. Um, those are the forecasts for 2020. Uh, looking at 2021, I think the forecasts uh, show that there will be recovery in the world economies. Uh, but I think we have no reason to believe that in, uh, in year 2020 and looking at the forecasts, the past, uh, that we're going to be in this crisis uh, for uh, a shorter time than, than, than the year 2020. So 
what's the new normal that uh, we should be prepared for? Uh, looking at Kenya, um, for one, we looked at our currency. Uh, what, what does this backdrop mean for our currency? I think looking at forecasts and our own extrapolations, uh, we can anticipate to see a continued depreciation of the Kenya shilling. The, the depreciation of the shilling will, of course, be led by several factors. Uh, we expect to see lower forex earnings from our horticulture, uh, remittances from the diaspora. Um, we expect to see that also uh, the, that locally that uh, uh, businesses, uh, people will be looking to move uh, currencies to, to, to the hard currency. So we expect all this to contribute to a continued depreciation of the shilling. Uh, we anticipate that probably by the end of year 2022, the shilling will be at about 123 shillings. Uh, that's just a forecast, but it's something I think for us to keep in mind uh, that we for sure will be uh, looking at a continued depreciation. Of, of the shilling. The other item that we have, of course, looked at is uh, the Kenya government uh, position. Um, tax revenues uh, have continued to increase. Um, they, however, continue to be well below the OECD average of 34% uh, of tax revenue to GDP. We are currently at about 18%. Um, the original estimate for tax collections this year had been to about 2.6 trillion shillings against a budgeted spend of 2.76 trillion shillings. Um, forecasts from uh, Treasury, from uh, Central Bank, uh, had taken into account perhaps a three month um, a crisis that we'll be in had expected a deficit in, uh, in the tax collections by about 569 billion shillings. Uh, emphasis here is that th that was assuming a three month uh, hit. If it's any longer uh, than three months, then perhaps we would be seeing uh, tax collections at closer to the 2019 uh, collections of about 1.5, 1.6 trillion shillings, or even lower if, if this crisis persists uh, beyond year, year, year 2020. Uh, that then for us informs that we could be seeing a huge uh, deficit uh, in the government budget. Uh, that may trigger increased borrowing by the government. Um, that would ordinarily lead to a spike in the interest rates uh, in the country. Um, we don't anticipate the spike in interest rates to be too steep. Uh, mainly because as money is looking for safer destinations, perhaps there'll be more money being allocated to government securities for as long as they continue to be viewed as safe. So while we anticipate a spike in interest rates, it may not be as steep as, as what we saw in the, in the period uh, after, after the 2008-2009 crisis. However, this is one that we, of course, will all continue to be watching uh, as we make our investment uh, decisions. So given that backdrop of uh, perhaps we'll be in this crisis for a period longer than a year um, with a, a big government budget uh, deficit with increasing pressure on the shilling and uh, continued depreciation of the shilling, a potential rise in interest rates, then how are businesses to respond? What should businesses do to respond to this situation that we're going to find ourselves in, perhaps for the better part of, uh, of year 2020. Um, I think it's imperative on businesses to first think about uh, what will this crisis do to consumers? Uh, will there be changes in consumer uh, patterns, in consumer behavior? I think the longer this crisis persists, um, it will lead to some changes in consumer patterns perhaps some of the changes being uh, permanent changes. Some of the patterns that we see in the short to medium term uh, is of course disc discretionary spending will take a hit. Uh, luxury items, flowers, jewelry, uh, passenger vehicles and others are likely, we are likely to see decreased uh, expenditure on those areas. On uh, consumer retail, uh, we anticipate to see that there'll be increasing focus on uh, last mile delivery with the customers preferring uh, zero contact 
um, between them and the, and the retailers. Uh, some sectors will, of course, be significantly disrupted in the short to medium term, amongst them transport, uh, travel and tourism, uh, hospitality, we expect to see those uh, disrupted as people opt to work from home and use more of technology. Uh, restaurants, of course, uh, we've seen safety measures being instituted. Um, perhaps those will also change uh, how and where uh, consumers prefer to go out to. There's, of course, a big question lingering around real estate. Uh, we anticipate, just given the amount of real estate, uh, commercial real estate in particular, that may be affected, we might see a correction in real estate prices. Um, of course, as more people opt to work from home, to work remotely, uh, we'll see businesses, individuals making decisions to let go of some of the commercial uh, real estate. Um, it is not all doom and gloom in the, in the real estate. Of course, people will continue to need somewhere to live, and perhaps there'll be opportunities opening up in uh, the affordable housing segment. The focus here on the affordable housing segment is uh, primarily because as uh, incomes reduce, as uh, people look to spend less and keep more cash, uh, decisions will be made uh, to take up more affordable uh, housing. We anticipate that there will be increased investments in technology in both hardware and software, uh, and that is one area that we expect to see uh, continued growth. As far as businesses go and uh, responding to this uh, uh, crisis, to this pandemic, there is of course the tactical, uh, what we like, what we are calling the survival, uh, which is more short term. What do businesses do to ensure that they survive, say, the immediate 12 months? And then there's more, and the second area is more around adaptation. Uh, how do businesses adapt to changes in consumer behavior? Uh, we anticipate that there'll be changes in local supply chain. Uh, we anticipate, of course, changes in the economic fundamentals. Um, and how do businesses adapt uh, to, uh, to, to this? Um, I think immediately, of course, uh, on the tactical side or to survive, uh, businesses should make a concerted effort to conserve cash. Um, we think businesses should be looking to build at least a 12-month cash reserve, uh, which is important because it is likely that incomes across different businesses are going to come down, collections will also come down significantly. Uh, businesses will still require to keep a certain amount of expenses to remain afloat, and therefore really the the immediate tactical decision is to conserve cash. There's lots, lots of opportunities that businesses should be looking at. A reduction in discretionary expenditure, advertising, rent, travel. Uh, businesses should be making decisions to become more frugal around the offices use, uh, staff where there are excess staff. Uh, perhaps this is also the time to critically look at uh, businesses, product lines that had been loss making um, and had been loss making for a while. Uh, I like a quote by Winston Churchill which says, never let a good crisis go to waste. And perhaps this is the time to make some of those hard decisions and let go of some of the loss making products, uh, business lines. Uh, for instance, um, I'm aware of uh, some, some businesses in, the, in say the horticultural industry because of um, various reasons, uh, markets are no longer accessible, uh, demands, uh, demand for their products is, is no longer viable, but, that had, but the crisis in their particular sectors have been persisting for a long time. Perhaps now is the time to move away from some of those luxury horticultural products and move to maybe more basic uh, food uh, items with the same infrastructure that the business has had uh, for say flowers, for instance. Um, I think the other area that businesses need to be looking at is the reallocation of uh, cash to where it's available to high yielding instruments, uh, high yielding but safe uh, government instruments, treasury bills and the like. Uh, perhaps also allocating to hard currency assets uh, in this environment as we anticipate a continued depreciation of the shilling. I think the third area where businesses can look at, uh, though may be limited, uh, where there's a, that limited opportunity to liquidate some assets, uh, this may be the good time to look at it. It may mean taking some capital losses on some of the items, 
but in favor of cash, which I think the old adage of cash is key now plays more true now than uh, ever before. Um, in the short term, also businesses need to be looking at their supply chains, uh, looking at where to source product from, where to look, where to source raw material from. Uh, it might be in the short to medium term with a possible backlash against China that has been a topic in some of the uh, of the media that we are coming across. Uh, of course, there is a real uh, disruption in uh, in international trade, and maybe moving some of the supply chain uh, locally and creating new routes uh, for, for 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 supply of critical products. Uh, businesses also need to be looking at in the short term of the products or the services that you're currently delivering. Uh, how can you create new routes to to, to customers? Uh, it may be retail, it may be supermarket business, you might even be in uh, some of the soft uh, services, professional services, it could be accounting services, could be legal services. How do you reach the same customers that you had by now noting that in maybe the next 12 months we'll continue to have uh, um, semi-lockdown, semi-curfews, uh, and, uh, um, and of course, then that means access to customers, physical access to customers continues to be disrupted. So these are all things that businesses should be looking and asking themselves on how do we survive uh, the, the current phase that we are in. Um, of course, in terms of adaptation, uh, looking at the different sectors that businesses are in, Overall, uh, like mentioned earlier, businesses should be looking at what change in consumer behavior do we expect? Do we expect less spending? Do we expect shift to essential products and services? Um, what disruptions will there be in supply chain? Uh, what will be the economic fundamentals that we expect to see? And then coming up with, say, four to five multiple scenarios, and what are the trigger points for each of them? Of course, there is no one size or one shoe fits all. Um, so each of the businesses, each of the different sectors have to look at what can businesses do uh, uh, today. Uh, we have looked at perhaps what are the immediate opportunities. Um, there's opportunities to diversify. Uh, there's perhaps opportunities to redeploy staff to higher yielding uh, opportunities. We've then gone ahead and looked at what are the possible winners across different sectors where there are immediate opportunities. Um, of course, there are some obvious winners in healthcare as this pandemic persists. Uh, producers of PPE, uh, that's personal protective equipment, uh, vaccines, pharmaceuticals, we expect to see continued a huge demand. Uh, speaking to healthcare generally, um, just going back and looking at the seven pandemics that we've had over the last century, uh, four of those uh, seven pandemics have been in the last 20 years, um, which means that we are seeing an increasing regularity of uh, pandemics. Now on average, a pandemic on average, say every five years. And perhaps a new normal is that even after we overcome the COVID-19, that perhaps in another five, maybe another 10, uh, there might be another pandemic that we are, we are going through. So uh, healthcare we see as an obvious winner. Uh, retail and supermarkets, I think that will continue as another obvious winner uh, with uh, social distancing as a new way of life. Uh, the retail will still continue to be strong, uh, but of course the experience is what is changing uh, with more focus on last mile uh, delivery. Another obvious winner of course is the telecommunication sector anything that enables technology, enables businesses to continue to reach their customers without physical contact. Uh, we think anything in that space, of course, will continue to be an obvious uh, winner. Uh, some of the other sectors that will go through different experiences, um, and we'll just maybe try to suggest what businesses should do in, uh, in those sectors. Uh, consumer goods and services, um, I think the, it's imperative that businesses quickly understand the changing customer preferences and uh, prioritize uh, production of essential goods and, and services for, for uh, customers. I think over the next uh, 12 months, that's what we can anticipate to see, that more spending will be on essential goods and services. Of course, uh, contactless uh, distribution will be key. 
And so those producers who are able to get to the last mile, I, th I think we'll have, of course, increase in your market share. Um, anything that enhances customer experience, of course, will continue to, uh, to be key. In the financial services sector, for instance, in the case of banks, uh, liquidity protection is going to be key. Uh, investing in highly liquid instruments, I think, will also be key. Again, adoption of cashless and mobile money services is going to be uh, to, to be key. Uh, we've already begun seeing some, some of the banks making decisions to shut down some of the physical operations uh, in favor of uh, technology, and that we anticipate will continue to be, to be the trend. In manufacturing, I think we think that here there's opportunity in innovation, uh, moving to essential products. Uh, we think there is also room to think about production cycles. Uh, there's perhaps room to also look at uh, your receivables collections and see what you can do to just increase uh, cash. Um, education is one of the sectors where there is uh, a plethora of opportunities. Uh, as more and more learners adopt uh, e-learning tools, uh, this applies right from uh, primary school children all the way to even uh, workplace learning. Uh, there will be need for uh, learners to continue to develop themselves um, and we think there's lots of room particularly in the education sector uh, to innovate and to monetize uh, some of the opportunities that are, are quite ready. Um, Agribusiness uh, will have varying effects uh, some of the more uh, luxury items uh, flowers for instance uh, those will be disrupted in the short to medium term as people focus more on uh, essential services of course, export markets will be affected just because of the logistics. And so now is the time for those in the agribusiness sector to think, to really think deeply about um, local uh, markets and how to access local markets. Local here, not just being in country, but across, across the, the, the region, the East African region. In the technology sector, uh, again, this is one sector where depending on, on the focus, uh, there'll be lots of need for solutions uh, contact tracing, thermal imaging solutions. Uh, as the healthcare crisis continues, uh, more and more we'll be looking at technological uh, solutions for, for us to go back uh, to as normal as, as possible. So those are just some of the insights that we had across different sectors. It's of course difficult to prescribe one for every sector, uh, but I think the critical message is right now that businesses need to be thinking about how do we survive the next 12 months, the, tactic, the real tactical survival decisions? And then in the medium term, what do we do to adapt to, consume, to changing consumer uh, patterns? Um, looking at uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, because we know businesses may have had this as part of the strategy, uh, maybe thinking about maybe now is the time to either sell my business, acquire another business to grow, uh, as means of just surviving uh, the, the, the current uh, pandemic that we find ourselves in. And so while this may be a real viable solution uh, to survival and also to adapting and to growing uh, even in this uh, pandemic, uh, we however see a short-term decline in appetite. Um, and this is just because of the uncertainty caused by this pandemic. Uh, it is almost impossible now to, to forecast earnings, to forecast growth, uh, to focus to changing consumer patterns, which means it's difficult for business for business owners to uh, then come to an agreement about the future. This, of course, then leads to a very difficult point around valuation, and we expect to see uh, huge valuation gaps uh, between buyers and sellers. Um, that said, we, of course, expect to see the number of distressed sales uh, increase in this period as well. And so perhaps there's opportunity uh, for businesses to combine, for businesses to acquire. Of course, some sectors are harder hit than, than, than others and distressed uh, sales will become uh, more and, and, and more the norm. And, and so this is a time for businesses to, to really look and see is uh, mergers and acquisitions, is this a viable strategy to, to going through this uh, pandemic? Uh, some of what to think about is also then what's the availability of, of financing, assuming one is looking at an acquisition. Uh, what's the quality of the financing, the tenor available? We also anticipate that this may dry up in the short term. Uh, but however, uh, there's still opportunities. 
because there are those who have capital and looking to deploy it uh, across across the the, 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 the region, uh, ourselves included. Um, of course, due diligence areas, uh, new due diligence areas have arisen. Uh, lots of boards of companies contemplating M and A's, uh, private equity firms, uh, lenders, financiers will be asking themselves. Um, in addition to all the other questions that one would during due diligence inquiries, is what's the resilience of our business today uh, to future uh, pandemics? Will businesses today be able to survive the current uh, pandemic? And so new due diligence areas will arise. And I think as business owners, then one would need to ask themselves, uh, how ready am I uh, to, to respond uh, to all these queries that are going to arise? Of course, you can generally anticipate that deal timelines are going to be extended uh, just because of all the factors I've mentioned above. But in addition, of course, just the practical regulatory approvals, third party approvals for them to come through, this will take much longer. So if any business is looking at uh, m and during this time as part of the strategy for either survival or for growth, then of course one must also take into account the timelines uh, that, that this will uh, take. Um, so that's, that's it for today. Uh, we are happy to invite uh, any questions and answers. Uh, we will of course be available for this and several other topics that we continue to handle and we look forward to the continued engagement. But for now, I'll hand back to Wambua to moderate us through the question and answer session. Uh, thank you for your participation and uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, um, for, for the insightful uh, review of the, of the current situation that we find ourselves in. Um, personally, um, as businesses and, uh, and, and, and as economies around the world, um, the, the review around what should businesses be doing, I think, is, is something most of the businesses have been asking or asking themselves about. And most of them have, uh, as you have highlighted, have, have really been on a, on, on a crisis on a crisis mode. Um, but also something important that you've brought out, which, uh, which, which is quite important for everybody who's, who's running a business, and I, I'd want to imagine also for the economies and the economists, is that we should not just be dealing with the, with the tactical to deal with, with the issues that we're dealing with now, uh, just to make sure that uh, the businesses uh, navigate through this period. But we also need to be planning for what will come. There's, there's no certainty in terms of uh, uh, the assumptions we are using or in terms of how the economy will be. But uh, we still need to, to spare some time to think about what the future, how the future is going to be, especially given the changes uh, in consumer behavior, the changes in the econ in economic fundamentals, uh, the supply chain changes, and even the disruption that's becoming, uh, that's happening to our to our business models. But uh, besides that, I'd, um, we've received quite a number of questions, and uh, we thank you for that. And please continue sending questions through the the questions uh, tab. Um, and uh, the first question that's um, that's come in is, um, is is really around the economy. Uh, everybody is really worried about the economy. And uh, one of the questions that's come in is, um, and and this uh, will go to Fred is. Uh, how do you see the, the the how do you how long do you think this this situation will last and how do you see the economy picking up uh, from 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 this situation and how soon thank you okay. great uh, thanks Wambu, and thanks to the for, for the question um i think we all wish we had uh, that crystal ball uh, that will uh, tell us uh, how how long it will be this crisis and when it will end um I think we are looking at two issues here. There is uh, the first of the public health issue, uh, which is the virus. Uh, how long will the virus be with us? Uh, again, just looking back at history, looking back, back at flu pandemics, there hasn't been a pandemic we've been able to deal with uh, looking back at the world in a period of less than 14 months. Um, maybe we've gotten better at dealing with pandemics as technology has increased. But I think it's safe to say we'll be with this virus for a period of at least 12 months. We've already gone through maybe three, four months uh, with the virus. So I think we have got a good reason to believe the virus will be with us for uh, the better part of the year going up to December. The second separate issue is then what does that mean for the economy and how long will the economy take to recover? Of course, the virus has brought with it uh, the issue of slower productivity. Um, across different economies, and that's why 
in lots of economic focus, we see and we anticipate uh, negative growth uh, in, in economies. The economic crisis will, of, will last longer than the public health crisis. I think that's a reality that we need to accept. Um, looking at the last global financial crisis, um, it's, it looks like it will be maybe with us for say two, two and a half years. So we are probably looking at coming out of this in maybe the end of 2021, 2022 perhaps. Um, and I, I think that's a period that businesses need to be uh, looking at, uh, forecasting, uh, continue depressing economic activity for the next uh, one to uh, two years. Um, Thank you, friends. Also, uh, maybe just, just to close off, um, I think um, economists also like to look at recovery. Uh, if you look at uh, if you look at uh, different graphs that have been uh, put out there, uh, there could be the V graph where uh, we come out of this fairly quickly, which I think everyone is hoping for, where, they, where we are in and out uh, of, 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 of this crisis pretty quickly. So maybe by 2021, everything is up and moving, uh, which is the, the V. It could be a U, where perhaps getting out of the crisis takes a bit longer, maybe a one to two year period. Uh, it could be a, a W, uh, where it's not quick in and out. It's, uh, we might see a short-term gain, and then if there's a, perhaps a second deadlier wave coming through, then we go back into recession and it may then come out maybe a bit later. Or it could be a, the dreaded L, L, L ship recovery where the coming out is a very long stretch, uh, where of course all of will not be the dreaded air that could take uh, several years, uh, and hope it's, it's more of a V uh, coming out of, of this. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Fred, for that. Um, I know that was one of the questions it's, uh, that uh, quite a number of the, of, the, of the attendees have actually asked. Uh, if you allow me, um, uh, let me introduce uh, our fellow partner, Thomas Omondi, who's, uh, who's on the call. Thomas is the Group Chief Operating Officer for Centum Investments and is also a partner at uh, Centum Capital uh, Partners. Um, and, and, and with that, I'd uh, like to, to just uh, ask Thomas to, to tell us uh, what are some of the key challenges, because that's one of the questions that's coming out. What are some of the key challenges that businesses have had to deal with over the last one or one or so months during this period of uh, COVID-19 and uh, how the business has navigated those challenges. Thank you. Good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wamboa, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, as I've been introduced, I'm um, uh, Thomas. Um, a lot of the challenges uh, Wamboa have already been alluded to by Fred in his very uh, elaborate presentation. But if I may just recap, um, one of the things that the businesses have had to do is actually to invoke the uh, business continuity plans. So basically to do some, uh, you know, stand up uh, crisis management. Um, you do realize that a lot of businesses have uh, what we call uh, BCPs, which they've never really tested. So obviously they had to invoke the business continuity plans. So, so it has been a very good opportunity for the businesses to test uh, how resilient uh, they are. But most importantly, which is uh, related to what you just mentioned was uh, fundamentally to ensure uh, employee health and safety. Because I remember, for example, in uh, in uh, Centum, in the group, when the first uh, case was announced, we, we assembled and we quickly decided actually that uh, everyone should actually work from home. Uh, and there was no reason why we could not do that uh, within the very minute or the next day, because we, we had very elaborate business continuity plans. And majority of our staff for the last more than 30 days, more, actually more than 95% of our staff for the last 30 days have been working from home. But uh, having said that, uh, the other thing obviously that uh, businesses have had to do is to make sure that they secure and enable work uh, from home. Uh, so a lot of businesses, uh, I suppose, have uh, flexi time uh, policies. Those which do not have, uh, have had to develop quickly some uh, policies. They've had to make sure that uh, the IT departments are working overtime to make sure that the staff are provided with tools to be able to work. They've also had to come with, uh, with rules uh, of engagement. I know, for example, in uh, Centum Capital uh, Partners and uh, in Centum Business Solutions, all the teams have uh, check-ins. So like in CCAP, we have check-ins every morning. 
and we have check-ins every evening on uh, Monday to Friday with very clear um, uh, work plans that have been agreed uh, agreed on. And I think the other thing which is much more related to businesses, obviously, is that uh, businesses have had to worry about uh, financial stability. Um, whether we are talking about uh, large or small businesses. The challenge with the small businesses has always been that uh, they, have, they don't have a lot of uh, headroom. They don't have a lot of headroom in terms of cash. So more often, uh, the businesses uh, generate revenue for this month. And some of these businesses, because they are owner managed, uh, they commingle funds or they withdraw some of the, this money to buy personal assets. And therefore, they may not have uh, cash for more than uh, three months. So you would see that some of these businesses are actually challenged that uh, they will not be able to operate beyond uh, beyond three months. And maybe finally, um, uh, I could just mention alongside what Fred already mentioned, is that uh, some of the businesses, uh, despite having cash and despite having inventory for a longer period, have had challenges with distribution. Uh, you remember Fred talked about last mile. Uh, a lot of guys now have had to to go into partnerships. You know some of the partnerships in the market, uh, like you know, we know, for example, Twiga have partnered with Jumia, ETC. So there have been those challenges of uh, supply chains being disrupted, despite the fact that people have had uh, inventory. So I guess uh, those are some of the things that I can just think about, uh, but obviously Fred mentioned, uh, alluded to quite a number of them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for that. Um, I think a question that's coming up, uh, and it's uh, probably related to, 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 to the nature of business that uh, Centum does, um, and, and this goes to Fred, is um, how do you see the, this situation? How is it impacting the strategies that uh, investors will be taking as, the, as they go forward? How, how do you see that, uh, that playing out? Yeah. Um... Yes, yeah, so of course um, it, uh, it well it depends on, on two two factors. Uh, one, of course, the investors' own views about uh, about how long you're going to be in this uh, uh, cycle. Uh, for perhaps the conservative uh, investors, uh, we anticipate to see them packing their cash uh, more and more into liquid uh, securities, uh, liquid opportunities, liquid assets. Uh, we expect to see more and more uh, perhaps uptake of safer securities. I, I mentioned the, the government uh, bonds and bills, uh, and perhaps that's where uh, we, we, we may see a lot of cash getting allocated. Uh, for countries, that may be good because it means maybe interest rates will be kept low as more and more investors uh, pursue uh, government securities. Um, it may be that for those who take uh, a view that we might be in and out, perhaps the recovery will, will take more of a V-shape. I think uh, this was on a time when we expect those with the liquidity to be making uh, bids for distressed assets, um, hoping to, to, to come in. Uh, I think it's, it's Warren Buffett who likes to say he, he likes to acquire uh, stocks cheap and sell high. So we might see investors who perhaps have got uh, a view that we'll be in and out of this uh, cycle much quicker, looking for opportunities to deploy, uh, acquire assets uh, on, on the cheap. Uh, so I, I, I think it depends on investors' views. I think the cash they have at their disposal and the risk appetite, it could be a combination of all of them. Uh, but, but definitely, uh, there's, there's, there's definite opportunities even in this kind of environment. Uh, to acquire uh, assets, uh, uh, perhaps it's very valuable assets at maybe uh, prices that we have not seen uh, for a long time. Uh, in, in the private equity markets, of course, we one of the key things that we track is the enterprise value to EBITDA uh, multiples. Uh, I think prior to uh, up to last year, we had seen multiples trending up to 10, 11x. Um, we might see some of the EV EBITDA multiples coming down uh, during the financial crisis, global financial crisis. I think we have seen a low on average of as, of as low as, as, as 4x, uh, which means there is definite opportunities even in this uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, I'm, I'm sure that has been quite, uh, quite insightful. Uh, but uh, as, a, as is always the case with uh, when, when a lot of uncertainty is there, 
uh, really nobody has a, a crystal ball to see what's, what the economy is going to look like. And um, what, what for us we are presenting are just our views. And uh, when, I know the situations will keep changing as, uh, as we move along and we'll need to see how to, to adapt to them. Uh, Thomas, I uh, just wanted to, to, to send a question your way from uh, one of the attendees is asking about what do you see happening to, to demand uh, as, as, as we go forward, uh, uh, given, given all the changes that are happening, consumer preferences, uh, consumer behavior is changing, uh, we are having challenges with the supply chain. What do you see happening with the demand? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question, uh, Wamboa. Um, I mean, if you just look at, for example, I was just looking at um, a, a picture which was sent to me on WhatsApp this afternoon, uh, with all the tankers packed uh, all over the place uh, because they cannot uh, discharge the oil. So if I if I use that as an analogy, I think what's going to happen, and Fred already mentioned this, is that uh, those sectors which are going to be winners, you know, like uh, we talked about uh, healthcare, for example, we talked about technology. And we talked about uh, essentials uh, in some areas of uh, FMCG. So uh, those those particular sectors are where people really are going to to spend their money, and the the impact uh, or the 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 effect of that is that people will decide um, what is essential because even when you talk about organizations or companies, individuals are also deciding um, what they want to buy and what uh, what is the luxury. I remember Fred talking about jewelry, for example, uh, Fred talking about personal cars. Uh, he, also, he also talked about flowers, though, of course, we don't necessarily manufacture flowers, but we do value adding. So what's going to happen is that demand will, uh, will shrink. It has already shrunk. Um, and uh, it will rise in those areas where um, consumers feel are essential, like healthcare, you know, like uh, PPEs, ventilators, uh, masks. Um, uh, essentials like uh, food. So those are the areas that uh, that I see demand picking. The impact of that, obviously, on employment is that uh, in those sectors which are viewed uh, luxury, as uh, Fred mentioned, there will be reduction in uh, in uh, in labor. And in those sectors where it's deemed uh, important, there will be employment. I mean, I was just watching the news yesterday. The government has spent more than a billion shillings in recruiting additional healthcare professionals. So you can already see that there is going to be a realignment uh, in terms of employment. So that's what I would say um, is going to happen at this point. Obviously, uh, we'll, uh, we will watch and see what's happening in the next uh, couple of months, as Fred has already mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, probably we'll, uh, we'll take uh, one more question. I think a question that's coming through is uh, around uh, what do we think that uh, businesses are going to, where do we think uh, businesses are going to prioritize uh, their capital? And I think uh, this is a question that uh, Fred has, has answered, but I'd just like to add um, a few things to it. Uh, one of them being that uh, obviously most businesses in terms of capital are right now going to prioritize around cash. But uh, in terms of investment, um, I believe uh, a lot of the operating businesses are still going to invest in their in their in their internal operations and and this is because of the changing in the in the supply chain so they'd want to adapt very quickly to the change in supply chain and therefore they may they'll have to to invest in that um other businesses as you've seen there's been quite quite a lot of technological disruption uh if you may say and the technological disruption is coming both from uh, how consumers want to to relate with the businesses as well as on the supply chain side so businesses will start investing in that very quickly. And um, probably I may also add that uh, when, when businesses start looking at that and looking at capabilities that they don't have, then they may start looking for some of the strategic acquisitions that allow them to build up their capabilities very quickly without, uh, without investing uh, in the operation itself, but rather through, uh, through an acquisition. Um, so that's just, uh, my, 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 uh, just a, a few thoughts around that. And uh, I think for us, uh, we, I think we've answered as, as many of the questions and as uh, many of the critical questions as, as, as have been sent. So what I um, would like to do is I uh, would like to bring the, this the Q&A session to a close and uh, would like to thank all of you for participating uh, and joining us in uh, this uh, first webinar, which was uh, on what can we do to prepare for the world that comes after COVID-19. We'll be having a second um, a second webinar, which will be will be doing um, in the next uh, in the next fortnight, which will be 
on the 14th of May. And this will really be focused around uh, how businesses have transitioned uh, their employees from working in, in the office uh, and being very office focused and transitioning to working from home and how businesses are making sure that uh, employees are, are being productive and are sticking to, to reaching and committing to meeting their goals. So we look forward to, to seeing you in the, in, uh, on 14th. And I uh, would like to thank you. And uh, more importantly, we'd also like to thank uh, uh, the panelists uh, who've, uh, who've uh, taken us through this, this session. We thank you for this. And uh, we want to wish you uh, that you keep safe. Uh, keep safe. Uh, let's follow the government directives. And uh, more importantly, God bless. And uh, we pray to see uh, all of us coming through this economic cycle uh, uh, positively. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.